Normandy is won, and now Patton is determined to destroy the German army and put an end to the war. It seems that nothing can stop Patton and his armored divisions from completing a legendary charge across France. But Patton's bosses continue to infuriate him. Will controversial decisions by Eisenhower and Bradley keep Patton from his ultimate victory? General George S. Patton, his bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360-degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, leading the charge. August 20th, 1944. Following the success of the D-Day landings and the Normandy breakout, the Allies are now pursuing the German army deep into France. Hitler is getting squeezed on two fronts as the Russians advance in the east. As day breaks over a long valley near Chambois, France, thousands of soldiers and armored vehicles of the German 7th Army are retreating on the double, aiming for a narrow two-mile wide gap, but they are nearly surrounded. It's called the Valet Gap, but it will soon become known as the Valley of Death. General Patton was driving fast and furious from the south, and he wanted to bag all of the Germans that he could within the Filet Gap. Over the treetops, American aircraft close in. The P-47 Thunderbolts are armed to the teeth and about to feast on the exposed army. The fast-flying P-47 fighter bomber carries up to 2,500 pounds of bombs. Even more lethal are its eight Browning M2 machine guns, mounted four per wing, each firing at up to 800 rounds per minute. Today, the descendants of the P-47 pack an even bigger punch while supporting ground troops. P-47 Thunderbolt has a modern equivalent in the form of an aircraft that was some, that is sometimes referred to as the Thunderbolt II, the A-10, sometimes called the A-10 Warthog, that is used exclusively for tactical close air support purposes. After the P-47s rip through their ammunition and shred the orderly retreat, Artillery shells begin exploding everywhere. Above the destruction, on the western slopes, the Canadian Army guns are zeroed in. On the eastern side, General George Patton's 3rd Army is raining down fiery lead. Two Massachusetts tankers, Tony Darpino and Don Neff, survive the horrors of Normandy to witness the destruction of an army. It's like a shooting gallery. All our tanks were lined up firing. Everybody took a turn firing. You and the gunner got so tired of shooting that he let somebody else shoot. Such carnage I have never seen in my life. A whole Seventh Army shot up. Sickened by the slaughter, some even cheer the enemy onward. Dreaming on a motorcycle, and everybody and his brother was shooting machine gun at him. 
You can see the bullet sitting behind him. Come on, come on, move it, move it. You know, we want him to get away, you know, we don't want him to get hit. The devastation rages for hours. The road becomes blocked with the wreckage of burning vehicles and German corpses. The deafening explosions are a vivid reminder of another day, four weeks earlier, when the ground shook and Hitler's plans began to unravel. Flashback, July 25, 1944, Normandy, France. Operation Cobra, the Allies' heavy bombing campaign to break out from the beaches, unleashes nine million pounds of bombs. The American army breaks out of the deadly hedgerow country and begins a rapid charge across France. Leading the charge is General Patton, commanding an armored advance like none before. In one diary entry, he marvels at his own progress. In exactly two weeks, the Third Army has advanced farther and faster than any army in the history of war. Patton's drive across France was absolutely fantastic. This is something that he had been dreaming of all his life. This was an exhilarating moment. Patton refuses to stay put at his headquarters in the rear, constantly racing forward to motivate his men near the front lines. Corporal Francis Sanza, a mechanic from Pennsylvania, personally drives the general's jeep throughout France. One day, Sanza hits a large pothole. And I must have lift him off the seat about six inches anyhow, you know. He didn't say nothing to me. I had a habit of wearing my helmet sideways, you know. Then he got that little stick and he straightened out my head. He says, can you see better now? <laughs> It seems nothing can stop him, except for his former subordinate, General Omar Bradley, now Patton's boss. On the night of August 12th, Bradley orders Patton to halt his advance, leaving the Falais Gap wide open. Basically, you're looking at the opportunity of a lifetime and Omar Bradley getting cold feet. Patton was biased always towards seeing the opportunities. Other commanders were biased toward seeing the dangers. Patton is shocked. But after spending a year in General Eisenhower's doghouse, he decides to hold his tongue. As a result, the Allies fail to close the Falais Gap north of Argentan allowing thousands of Germans to escape in the days to come. Faced with a dire situation, Field Marshal Gunther von Kluge commands the limping German army. His men call him Clever Hans, after a famous horse that reportedly did arithmetic. In the Falais Gap, he'll need all the cleverness he can muster to rescue what's left of the 7th Army, including hundreds of tanks. He is basically a man with an impossible job and is going to try to do whatever he can to stall or stop and maybe even turn back the Allies, no matter how impossible a task this might be. But Adolf Hitler has lost all faith in his general. Von Kluge is a suspected conspirator in the attempt on the Fuhrer's life the previous month, when Hitler orders Von Kluge back to Germany on August 18th. The field marshal kills himself by swallowing cyanide. By August 20th, thousands of troops have already escaped, but some 50,000 men are still desperately trying to get out of the Valley of Death. As Allied artillery rains hellfire down on the enemy, just two miles to the east, Pat 
Britain's 90th Infantry Division stands in the path of the escaping Germans near Chamois. And the engagements were sharp, intense, fierce. Sergeant John Hawk from Washington State was drafted right out of high school in 1943. Now he's commanding a 30 caliber machine gun squad near Chamois. When the Germans counterattack to keep their escape route open. They came across this field with a whole bunch of tanks and a whole bunch of infantry. And we shot off all the infantry. The 31-pound, 30-caliber Browning light machine gun requires a two-man crew. Its air-cooled barrel fires a 30-odd-6 cartridge with a max fire rate of 500 rounds per minute from a 250-round belt. The position is overrun, and the two machine guns are taken out. Hawk takes cover behind an apple tree when a German bullet passes through his thigh. I see a lone guy from another outfit with a bazooka and six or eight rockets, but he's all by himself. He's got nobody to load for him and nobody to run shotgun for him. Together, the men begin to stop the enemy tanks. Every time we'd see a tank, why, he'd rear up and plant one on him, and then we'd disappear. The bazooka forces the tanks into a retreat out of the field. Sergeant Hawk gathers his men and quickly rebuilds a working machine gun from the parts of the two damaged guns. They pin down the remaining enemy infantry, but the Germans are hell-bent on dislodging the men of the 90th. John Hawk watches as three tanks re-enter the field. They are King Tigers, the Germans' biggest and most devastating tanks. And they are racing right at him. August 20th, 1944. Thousands of German soldiers are trapped in the Fallet Gap. Desperately trying to escape to the east between the British and Canadian forces to the north and Patton's Third Army to the south. So imagine the scene that you have here along this road of thousands of Germans being strafed and bombed, artillery coming in and falling amongst them, tanks blowing up, smoke everywhere. As the Germans surrender in mass in the Valley of Death, farther up the valley, near Chambois, A desperate panzer division is close to breaking out of the Allied noose. Three King Tiger tanks and German infantry are heading straight for Sergeant John Hawk's machine gun crew. Knowing his machine gun is useless against the Tigers, Hawk goes in search of a bigger gun. base of a ravine and out of sight of the Tigers sit two American tank destroyers. Still bleeding from a bullet wound, Hawk runs over and shouts at the commanders to open fire on the advancing Tigers. They, they said, we can't see them. So I said, well, I can see them. If I get out in the middle, uh, you line up on me, not an aiming stake, you line up on me and I'll get on the road and you shoot because there'll be one behind that building. With small arms fire all around, John Hawk climbs the ravine and becomes a human aiming stake. Hawk directed their fire so that it went directly over him and struck and destroyed these enemy vehicles.
for his unparalleled bravery at Chambois, Sergeant John Hawk is later awarded the Medal of Honor, personally presented by President Harry Truman after the war. When the Germans finally surrender near Chambois, the 90th Infantry Division alone takes 12,000 prisoners. Another 10,000 Germans are dead. For weeks after the battle, people said they would see a gray cloud over the valley of death. It wasn't a cloud. It was flies feeding off the dead bodies. But Patton wants more Germans, dead or alive. He gets General Bradley to agree to a new plan. He wanted to be able to just push Third Army directly over the Seine River and then continue moving forward with the hopes that he would be ordered to conduct a sweeping move that would pocket the enemy again. Field Marshal Walter Modell now plans to use the wide Seine River as a defensive front to stop Patton Cold. Modell replaced von Kluge the same day he committed suicide. As Modell proved at the Russian front, he excels at defensive wars of attrition. His men call him Frontschwein, or the frontline pig. Patton's plan is to capture several major bridge crossings, including those at Mance, Fontainebleau, and Troyes. In the center is the French capital of Paris. There was the old saying that he who controls Paris controls France. On August 19th, the French resistance in Paris stages a revolt against the Germans. The clock is ticking. If the Allies decide to invade, it needs to happen quickly. Eisenhower did not want to liberate Paris. Once you take Paris, you have to feed them. You have to take care of them. But Ike faces political pressure. The communists control the resistance in Paris, while the Americans and British want General de Gaulle to take control of a democratic government. Eisenhower allows a French unit to move into Paris and grab the glory. General Patton's Third Army is officially denied the prize, but ironically, not the headlines, as his diary points out. BBC said this morning that Patton's Third Army had taken Paris. Poetic justice, it'll be refuted, but no one will pay any attention. When Paris fell and was liberated, it was a wonderful, exhilarating moment. But for the Allied logistics planners, it was a nightmare because now they had to figure out how to get even more supplies, even more food, even more ammunition and stuff ashore, and they still didn't have the ports to do it. While the First Army struggles with Paris, General Patton is charging hard to capture several bridges over the Seine River. August 23rd, the enemy still controls all bridge crossings south of Paris. Patton's 20th Corps, 5th Infantry Division, called the Red Devils by the Germans in World War I, is marching on the first crossing. Target, the town of Fontainebleau. Strategy, capture the bridge intact, chase down the retreating Germans to the east. Tactics, use an intel and reconnaissance platoon to strike quickly before the defenders can blow the bridge. If it's blown up, it'll take days for them to build a pontoon bridge. They've got to keep that bridge intact. Sergeant Frank Chambers of the 735th Tank Battalion is commanding one of the lead tanks in the strike force. The Shermans dodge enemy small arms fire as they approach the Seine River crossing. So we went down to the river. We were getting ready to go across the river, and they blew the bridge. We did have one tank on the bridge when they blew it, on the first part. 
Amazingly, the explosives only take out the center section. Thanks to the handiwork of one member of the local French resistance. He disconnected the, the far side and the near side, and the only thing that blew was the middle. Battalion Commander Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Lemon, a West Pointer from Maine, knows time is of the essence. Little opportunity to bring up the uh, assault boats that I had in my column, and I spotted five rowboats across the river tied up to a stake upstream. There's fixed machine guns on that objective, just waiting for the Americans. It's a suicide mission. Lemon strips down, and with incoming enemy fire, he dives into the Seine River. Summer is nearly over. Patton's army is rolling like thunder across northern France. Paris is about to be liberated, and the retreating Germans are mounting a desperate effort to hold the Seine River crossings. We weren't about to let the Germans stop us by putting defenses up along the water's edge of a river and stopping the, the drive of the Third Army, and Patton wasn't about to let that happen. In one of his many letters, Patton is sure that victory is imminent. I am taking chances, he writes, but I'm convinced that the situation in the German army warrants the taking of such risks. And I am sure that if we drive him hard enough now, we will cause the end of the war in a very few days. At the town of Fontainebleau, just 25 miles south of Paris, the 5th Infantry Division and 735th Tank Battalion are looking to enforce Patton's will. As the American tanks begin to cross, the Germans blow the bridge over the Seine River. But Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Lemon, former captain of his West Point swim team, dives into the river to retrieve rowboats from the far side 300 yards away. My concern was that the downstream boat not be tied, and it was not. But I think I actually uh, <laughs> said a prayer. Lieutenant Colonel Lemon swam the breadth of the Seine River to the other side under fire from the enemy, where he found five small boats on the opposite bank. He gathered those boats together, tied them together, as the tanks cover his return, Lemon tows the boats across. Patton's men use the boats to get the first assault force across. By day's end, the Americans secure the East Bank. It's the first Seine crossing secured south of Paris. For the action of swimming across the Seine River under fire on August 23, 1944, Kelly Lemon was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. South of Fontainebleau, General John Wood's 4th Armored Division is nearing the bridge at Troyes. Wood is the fourth larger-than-life commander pushing his men to advance more than 350 miles in just 12 days. Major Alvin Erzik is a former horse cavalry officer from Massachusetts. He will soon command the 8th Tank Battalion and lead many critical battles in the months to come. We were so aggressive, and the resistance that we had, we could overcome with our mobility, firepower, and shock action. General Wood's key tactic is to move quickly around enemy resistance. What he wanted to do is get into the rear of the enemy and be able to destroy their logistics, destroy their, their armor, and maintain the initiative. So we were 
been moving faster than the uh, Germans could retreat. It was like the uh, hound chasing the wounded hare. At the tip of the 4th Armored Spear, probing enemy strong points ahead of the tanks, is the 25th Cavalry Recon. A recon platoon deploys in line with six jeeps, each carrying a 30 caliber machine gun or a mortar. Three armored cars are spaced at intervals throughout the line. This armored car is not a tank. The M8 Greyhound was designed to move quick, find the enemy, and provide reconnaissance. When a situation gets hot, the men can count on their tanks racing forward to take over the fight. And during the long, clear August days, they can also count on the Air Force. The 19th Tactical Air Force was Patton's ace in the hole. In front of Patton's tank columns flew several pairs of close air support aircraft, usually P-47s or P-51s. And they would clear the area to the front. In their drive across France, Patton's Air Force destroys 5,000 armored vehicles. Right behind those aircraft, would be spotter aircraft. And these L9 and Piper Cub aircraft would fly with observers, and they would be able to pass information back to the lead tank columns to tell them where the Germans were setting up, which was valuable intelligence information. General Wood, and even Patton himself, used the Piper Cubs to keep track of their advancing forces. Things are about to change for General Wood. On August 18th, he gets a new boss. Eisenhower appoints one of his own close friends, General Manton Eddy, an infantry commander, to lead the 12th Corps. Eddy now gives orders to the 4th Armored and Tiger Jack Wood. So we had this infantryman who knew nothing about armor with his great armor leader Wood. To preserve the fourth slash and burn tactics, Patton must transform Eddie's thinking, as his diary notes. He has been thinking that a mile a day was good going. I told him to go 50, and he turned pale. By the time the fourth approaches the Seine River crossing at Troyes on August 24th, they're closer to Germany than any other Allied division. Intelligence sources say that 500 enemy troops defend the town of Troyes. <laughs> Lieutenant Roger Boaz is from San Francisco and a forward observer with the 94th Armored Field Artillery Battalion. Despite his hazardous job, he'll be with the 94th until the end of the war. We knew there would be opposition in Troyes, but, but we thought it would be light. At least that was the general feeling. Boaz shares the duty of forward observer with Lieutenant Lewis Dent, a football star from Colorado State University. And he said, I know if I go in that attack and I've been ordered to go in, I can't make it. I'm going to die. I want to get out of it. How can I get out of it? Boaz suggests that Dent talk to their commanding officer, but the CO insists that he complete his scheduled duty. The next day, the 4th's tanks and infantry commence the attack on a wide-open, three-mile-long plain fronting the city. There's little cover, so the tankers push their engines to full power. As the tanks advance, American artillery begins to hammer the defenders. Ahead in the center of the firestorm. 
Lieutenant Dudent calls in the fire from his jeep. He went in with three other observers. He was on the radio giving firing commands, and we heard him, and then we heard him scream. And he was cut in two by machine gun fire. As the tanks approach the city, the Germans open up with several of the versatile and deadly 88 millimeter guns. The enemy resistance is impossibly fierce. That's because the original intelligence report of 500 defenders is dead wrong. Patton's men are about to slam headfirst into a 2,000-man brigade of SS troops. to crumble in mid-August 1944, General George Patton moves at will through liberated French towns. The admiring French citizens are the subject of one diary entry. I get quite an ovation, Patton writes. I used to wave back, but now I just smile and incline my head, very royal. We were the focus of such adoration and such hysteria. It's overwhelming. It is. When people wanted to touch you and, and almost pull you out of the vehicle and tearing your clothes. Many are rewarded with gifts of food, wine, and flowers. When Patton's 712th Tank Battalion passes through the Champagne country, Sergeant Tony D'Arpino turns his tank into a rolling wine rack. Now, behind the driver and the assistant driver, you had all these cubby holes where you store the ammunition. I fill up every one of them holes with bottles of champagne. I was drinking pink champagne for breakfast, dinner, and supper. One hundred miles south of Paris, at the city of Troyes on the Seine River, the men of the 4th Armored Division aren't celebrating. A force of 2,000 SS defenders are putting up a fierce fight. Sergeant Don George, an M-Fight light tank driver from Kentucky, is in the first wave. Oh, the accident happened so fast, we didn't have a chance to worry what's going to happen. It just kept going. We knocked out the machine gun desk, some of the 88s, and then the infantry followed up in back of us. The 10th Armored Infantry is gashed with a hail of machine gun fire and mortars. Near the edge of the city, the American Shermans are confronted with a seven-foot-wide anti-tank ditch. They had some ditches there that the tanks, on a full speed, up the ditches. We took the Germans by surprise. With most of the tank company inside the city, it becomes a ferocious street-by-street -street assault. They wouldn't quit. So we had to run them out door to door. We went down the street, machine gunning everything we could. As the Americans close in, the Germans blow the main bridge over the Seine. But the advance continues when two smaller bridges are captured intact. The action is so fierce, General Patton later describes the battle for Troyes as a magnificent feat of arms. In less than four weeks, the 4th Armored Division has advanced 500 miles across France. But the historic dash comes at a price. We find Patton's forces moving so far and so fast that they've outstretched their supply lines. In August of 1944, Patton's Third Army is consuming an average of 350,000 gallons of gasoline per day. A solution is needed fast. They create what's called the Red Ball Express, relaying trucks laden with equipment to the front. 
They're doing anything they can to keep Patton's army supplied. The general fears something else is going on. When Patton confronts Omar Bradley, he gets some crushing news. Eisenhower is diverting the Third Army's fuel in favor of British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. Field Marshal Montgomery approached General Eisenhower with a proposal, and the proposal was this. Take the limited fuel supply available, and rather than spreading it out over the broad front of the Army groups, give it to 21st Army Group, give it to Field Marshal Montgomery. Using the Canadians to the north and the American First Army to the south in support, Monty plans to attack Germany from the north through Belgium. For the resources to go to Montgomery, one of Patton's chief rivals, it had to have been absolutely frustrating. But the fuel tanks aren't dry yet. When Patton learns the 4th Armored Division is close to the Meuse River at Commercy, he demands a crossing, noting in his diary that General Matinetti can adopt World War I tactics if need be. We must and will get a crossing on the Meuse. In the last war, I drained three quarters of my tanks to keep the other quarter going. Eddie can do the same. But the river crossing at Commercy is a hornet's nest of German troops and equipment. Patton's legendary charge could end here. The month of August 1944 is a smashing success for General Patton. His forces have chewed up hundreds of miles, liberated most of France, and are now within just 60 miles of the German border. For Patton, the idea was to drive it home, keep the enemy running, never give them an even chance, never give them a chance to stop and set up a defense. August 31st. Target, the town of Commercy. Strategy. Capture the Meuse River crossing before Germans blow the bridge. Tactics, two tank companies will lead a surprise attack. Commercy is a rear area outpost in northeastern France. The Germans have no idea the Americans are in the area. Riding shotgun in his Sherman is Captain Jimmy Leach, a southern gentleman and company commander in the 37th Tank Battalion. He'll face off with German panzers many times in the months to come. As we came into Commercy, we only met one armored car en route. And our light tank company and recon were leading the column, and they knocked that out very quickly. That armored car didn't get off a message, apparently, that we were on our way. Two hundred yards ahead, German defenders have covered four deadly 88-millimeter guns to protect them from rain that just started falling. The act of God is well-timed. Before the scrambling Germans can uncover the guns, the American tank's 30-caliber machine guns cut down the defenders and secure the bridge. As usual, the fourth is so fast, they catch the Germans with their pants down. On the north side of town, the second tank company stumbles onto a busy German railroad terminal. The Germans were promenading on the streets. They were walking about. Trains were loaded up and steamed up, and some uh, were going back to Germany. The tanks quickly unload on the surprised Germans. Enemy troops are machine gunned before they can take cover. The Sherman's main guns take out two locomotives. A few miles to the east, a large column of enemy soldiers and vehicles are fleeing the devastation in Commercy. 
Forward Artillery Observer Lieutenant Roger Boaz watches from the hills above. And on this road were four or five hundred German troops, not moving very fast. They were moving, probably trying to get out, but they didn't realize they were within range of American artillery. And so I opened fire with 18 105 millimeter howitzers. They hit right away. The exploding lead tears into the enemy forces, devastating man and machine. But the Germans want revenge. They call on a fighting force that many believe is extinct. We all of a sudden see this fleet of planes. They weren't high. They were almost at ground level, maybe 25 feet above us. And I, of course, was terrified. The Luftwaffe is back in the game, and they are out for blood. They flew right over. My count was about 15 to 20. They were Messerschmitt 109s, and they were one of the best German attack craft. The Messerschmitt 109 lacks some of the punch of the American P-47, but its armament is formidable, including one 20-millimeter MG-151 cannon, two 13-millimeter MG-131 machine guns, and one 551-pound bomb. The 94th Artillery Battalion guns are dispersed and camouflaged, so the Messerschmitts instead target the more exposed 66th Artillery Battalion. And the planes found the 66. And they kept going down and going down, and of course, everyone fired back. A few Messerschmitts go down in flames, but the other aircraft take their toll on the men of the 66th before heading back to Germany. In the attack, the 66th lost six killed and 57 wounded badly enough to be evacuated. So it was a big hit. In the days that follow, the Luftwaffe continues to harass the 4th Armored Division near Commercy. But Commercy is also the end of the line for Patton's dash across France. Eisenhower's decision to redirect the 3rd Army's fuel supplies to Montgomery is a crippling blow to Patton. Always the loyal soldier, Patton's diary is the only place he can say what he truly feels. I have to battle for every yard, he writes, but it is not the enemy who's trying to stop me, it is they. The Third Army is going nowhere, but not everyone is singing the blues. We had an outdoor movie with uh, Bing Crosby and Going My Way. It was glorious as far as swimming and sunning and writing letters. But we were horribly, horribly worried. We knew that every day was a waste of day. Patton notes in his diary that his men could pay a terrible price for Eisenhower's decision. We should cross the Rhine, and the faster we do it, the less lives and munitions it will take. No one realizes the terrible value of the unforgiving minute except me. Some way, I will get on yet. Just one week ago, Patton believed the war could be over in days. But Ike's decision has altered the fate of the Third Army. And if the Germans can take advantage, there will be many more hardships and much more blood in the days to come.